Okay. So last time we uh, talked about some applications of uh, the Tom transversality theory. So today we will uh, switch gears a little bit and we're going to enter the section on intersection theory. But before we actually talk about intersection theory, we have to talk about some preliminaries. So today, it'll, the class will be just about the preliminaries. Uh, and then tomorrow, we'll really start talking about intersection theory. So the first part is we're going to talk about manifolds with boundary. So definition, so today will be a class of definitions and not a lot of amazing results. So just definitions and doing, generalizing what we did in the first part of the course, transversality for manifolds with boundary and orientation if we have time at the end. So a topological manifold. With boundary. is a second countable Hausdorff topological space such that every point, uh, every point, well, let me call it x. every point of X has an open neighborhood which is homeomorphic to an open set in the upper space, so HN. So HN is the set of points X1, XN in Rn such that Xn is bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, so let me draw a picture. So basically you want a topological manifold with boundary is a topological space which has these technical conditions, second countable Hausdorff, such that every point has a neighborhood which is uh, homeomorphic to an open set in this Hn. So in the upper half plane, so in the upper half Euclidean space. So, you know, you, you could have a point here that has an open neighborhood, which is diffeomorphic to a little ball in here. Or you can have a point here that has an open neighborhood, which is diffeomorphic to something here. And remember the topology on HN, I mean, it's kind of obvious, but it's the, the induced topology from Rn. So an open set in Hn is the intersection of an open set in Rn with Hn. So if I you know, have a point here, what is an open neighborhood of this point? It's something like this, for example, an open ball. And here you have this whole line in, and here you, have, you don't have the, the boundary. Okay, that's an open set in Hn. It's not open in Rn. Okay. So uh, here's a lemma. Um, let me call it a proposition, actually. Let, so you see that there are, it looks like there are two kinds of points. There are the kinds of points uh, that have an open neighborhood that looks like uh, a little open ball in the interior of HN. And there are the, the points that have an open neighborhood, uh, which is actually an open neighborhood of a point on this uh, hypersurface here. So this, this line here is a hi the hypersurface where xn is equal to zero. Okay. So the proposition is to actually show that you can actually differentiate these two points. So let x be a topological manifold with boundary 
uh, let p be a point in x and p and psi be charts. So a chart just means, you know, as usual, it's one of these embeddings, topological embeddings uh, from an open neighborhood of X into HN. Um, around P, and I'm going to assume that P of P belongs to the boundary of HN, which is by definition uh, the set of points such that HN is equal to zero. Okay, so it's this uh, hyperplane. Okay, then psi of p is also in this hyperplane. Okay, so the, the, what this proposition is saying is that having a chart that maps the point to this hyperplane doesn't depend on the chart. So if you choose another chart, then you have to map it to uh, this hyperplane. Okay, and the proof of this proposition, I'm going to leave as an exercise. But it's remarkably hard, actually. You, you basically have to show that if you have such an embedding, uh, a topological embedding, that it's a, a locally an open map. Uh, so that, you know, basically a, a, a little neighbor, you can, you can extend this to an embedding of U into Rn, and it has to be an open map, so that if you uh, actually start, say, from like a, something that goes to a ball here. Yeah, basically, it'll it'll imply that you cannot map an open ball in uh, in Rn to a half open ball like that. So it's that that fact itself is is a little bit hard to prove. I only know how to prove it using some algebraic topology. Um, yeah, so you can you can try to find it. I, I would say it's kind of a hard harder than you imagine. Harder then uh, harder than it looks. But still, I think it's worthwhile um, trying to do this if you, if you can. OK? So because of this proposition, you can actually define the boundary and the interior of x. So um, let x be a manifold with boundary. we can define the boundary of x to be the set of points such that there exists a chart around p such that phi of p, well, let me write this such that as a bar, belongs to the boundary of HN. OK, and because of this proposition, uh, this is well defined. It doesn't depend on the chart. So th these are the set of points uh, that are mapped to this hyperplane uh, HN equals 0 under a chart. That's the boundary. And the interior of x by definition, is x minus the boundary. It's the complement of the boundary. OK. And then now there is a maybe another exercise, but this exercise is a lot easier. Um, it doesn't require anything hard. The exercise is, oh, and by the way, this exercise here, if you uh, don't know the harder part, the, the algebraic topology part, you can still do the easy part which I think is, is still interesting. Like assuming that um, we know that, uh, that, that you know that a topological embedding uh, has to be, or oh, a topological, yeah, it's not, it's not, you don't know it's quite an embedding, you just know it's a, it's a homeom, yeah, it's a, it's a immersive injection, a topological immersive injection uh, has to be a local, uh, local open map. 
has to be an open mask. Yeah. Anyway, you can you can do your your research and, and try to prove this proposition. Okay. But this exercise, which is a lot easier, is that the interior of X and the boundary of X are both topological manifolds without boundary. Okay. Maybe you can see that already. I mean, um, this part, you know, the interior of X is pretty straightforward. Seeing that the boundary of X is a topological manifold with boundary, it's a little less straightforward. But the uh, of dimension, maybe I should add the dimension, N and N minus 1, respectively, where N is the dimension of X. OK, any questions about this? This definition? OK, so now let's talk about what a smooth manifold with boundary is. Uh, it's almost obvious, but there, there is just a couple, one subtlety. So a smooth manifold with boundary, and as usual, I'm going to drop the word smooth. Um, is a topological manifold with boundary. Endowed with a maximal smooth atlas. Okay, so it's exactly what you'd expect. But the I think the part here that you need to be a little bit careful about is what it means to be smooth. So, I mean, basically it's the same as before. You have this uh, underlying topological manifold. So every point has a neighborhood which is homeomorphic to uh, an open set in Rn. Uh, or even homeomorphic to the whole Rn. But now you have to throw away most charts, and you have to just keep the ones. You have to keep an atlas which is uh, compatible, so that all the transition functions are smooth. And you take the maximum smooth atlas that contains a given one, for example. That's one way to construct. So you have to talk about what it means for a map from Hn to Hn to be smooth, or from an open set of Hn to an open set of Hn to be smooth. Uh, so maybe I should just say as a remark, is that a map f from hn to hn is smooth. And, and I, I'm emphasizing this because usually we only talk about smoothness when the domain of the map is an open set of rn. If the domain is not an open set of rn, then the question is a little bit more subtle. Um, like, what does it mean to have, the, to have a derivative on the boundary and to have a derivative on this uh, hyper, hyper plane? But for in, in you know, when you're talking about smooth manifolds with boundary, we take kind of the the most strict, the, the strictest pos the condition possible for for smoothness, which is just to say that the map is smooth if, uh, by definition, uh, if it can be extended to a smooth map from a neighborhood of Hn. F tilde from a neighborhood, it won't fit, of Hn to Rn. Okay, so if we, if we can extend it a little bit so that it's still smooth. Okay, so in particular, we can talk about differentiability questions and everything all the way up to the boundary. Okay. So in particular, we can talk about 
differentiability all the way to the boundary. So in some way, you know, a manifold with boundary, you can think of it like this, you know. For, so for each point here, you can think, well, you, it, it's as if there was another, uh, the M manifold extended a little bit further and then you just cut it here. So for example, we can still talk about the tangent space in the same way. So uh, if X is a manifold with boundary, and P is a point on the boundary of X, then we can talk about the tangent space of X at P exactly the same way, because you can think about smooth curves that pass through this point uh, in all directions. And this is still is a vector, sp vector space of dimension N, the same dimension as the manifold. Because, you know, you really, to talk about the tangent space, the, the, the way I defined it, uh, you, you, the, the first way that I, that I defined was using equivalence classes of curves where the point is in the middle of the curve. So you'd be, you'd be like, okay, this is a little subtle, right? How do I get a curve that goes in this direction where this point is in the middle? So that's why I'm saying, you know, you, you can just kind of pretend because of this definition of smoothness that, um, the manifold goes a little bit further and then you kind of continue the curve just a little bit so that this guy is uh, this point is in the interior of the curve okay anyway you can you can write down all of this if this is uh, kind of exotic for you and it seems not rigorous enough I assure that it's all 100% rigorous and you can uh, you, you can make it rigorous if you'd like and if you get stuck, please let me know. But I'm, I'm assuming that you, uh, all of you, or most of you, you can make this rigorous. OK, so anyway, we have the, the tangent space at P. But also, if you are, uh, because the, the boundary of x, I guess maybe this is the second part of the exercise, which is that if you have a smooth structure, then the boundary and the interior are also smooth manifolds. Um, so then we can talk about, so the interior and the boundary are our smooth manifolds. Uh, and you can also talk about the tangent space to the boundary. So if X is on the boundary, then you can also talk about the tangent space to the boundary of X. So this is the equivalence class of curves which are contained on the boundary. So this, you know, it, it, it's easy to see that it's actually a subspace uh, of co-dimension one. And by the way, as usual, you know, when I say, when I, when I jump some steps and I don't write everything rigorously, an exercise is always to fill in the holes. Okay. And it's particularly relevant if you are uh, not sure about the steps. If it's all obvious for you, maybe, maybe you don't need to waste your time too much. But if it's not, maybe it's a good exercise. I'll leave you to, I think you have the maturity to determine that. OK, so let's talk about an example. Well, the first example that I can think of of a manifold with boundary is the ball, the n-dimensional ball, which for me is the set of points in our n such that the norm is less than or equal to 1. So this is a manifold. And its boundary uh, is exactly the n minus 1 sphere. So the set of points uh, with norm equal to 1. OK? So now um, let's prove a proposition that you know, this, is, this is not a unique feature that this is a manifold with boundary. Um, the proposition is that if you have a function, so let's say let, let x 
be a manifold without boundary. Uh, and f a smooth function from x to r. And by the way, when you have a manifold without boundary, I mean, often if I just say let x be a manifold, I'll mean a manifold without boundary. But it's, it can be a little bit ambiguous um, when you say a manifold. If you mean a manifold with a boundary or if you are requiring that there's no boundary. So if I, if I, I'm going to try to emphasize if it, if it doesn't have boundary. But the, the, I guess the standard is if you don't say that it has with boundary, then it is assumed to not have boundary. OK, someone wanted to say something. No? OK. You're still there? See? See, OK. All right, so uh, take a manifold with boundary and a function with values in R. Um, and take a regular value of the function. Let A be a regular value. We already know that the preimage of a regular value is a submanifold. Okay, but what I'm going to claim is that if you take the preimage of, say, the interval from minus infinity all the way to A, this is a manifold with boundary. And the boundary of this is just given by the preimage of A. Okay, you see the example of the ball is a special is a particular case of this, where the function is the norm or the norm squared. And well, how do we see that? Well, let me draw the proof. So first of all, uh, since the preimage of minus infinity a, well, this is an open set because f is continuous. So if an open set of a manifold is also a manifold, this is a manifold, a smooth manifold as I said, without boundary. So that means that every point in here uh, has a chart into Rn. Uh, and therefore, we can, be, you know, we can move this and, uh, and it has a chart into the interior of Hn. Okay, so basically every point in uh, the preimage of minus infinity a open uh, will have a chart that takes it up here. Okay, and here's your Hn. Now we have to see what happens in a neighborhood of the preimage of a. So let p be a point in the preimage of a. And now, as usual, you know, because it's a regular value. Uh, we can apply the implicit function theorem. So by the implicit function theorem, there exists a chart, um, a chart of x, I should say, near, uh, around, let me call this chart phi of u from u to rn around p um, such that, well, we can assume that phi of p is equal to 0. And we can assume that the composition of, uh, that basically, if, after you compose of this chart, all that you have is the projection onto xn plus a. OK, that's what the implicit function theorem will tell you in this case, or that's one, one incarnation of the implicit function theorem. You can just assume that the function 
uh, that, that it has this form. Uh, so uh, we can obtain a chart. So we obtain a chart, which is basically just phi. Uh, well, it's I'm going to call it phi bar, which takes x1, xn to minus xn. And the only reason I'm doing minus xn is because you know I'm looking at the pre-image of the points. Uh, so because my, my the set that I want to prove is a manifold is the pre-image of minus infinity a closed. Okay, and my function is xn plus a. So I basically want everything. Um, so this my chart, you know, here's my p, and this is the chart that takes it to um, now after I if I look in this chart, you know, composed with phi inverse, then my function just takes this le this level to a and it's linear, it's just the projection onto xn. Um, if this is your xn. Uh, so I, I just want to reverse uh, this direction so that I take a neighborhood here. Oh, let me do it red. I take a neighborhood here uh, to this thing. Okay, so that's my chart. And that basically finishes the proof. Okay, any questions about this? No? OK, so now let's talk about, yes, someone unmuted your microphone? Can you explain that in the drawing? This drawing here? Yes. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that you know, for the first part is that by the, by the implicit function theorem, I can assume that I can find a chart uh, so that in this chart, locally, uh, the map is just uh, the projection to the last variable plus a. OK, I think you, you, uh, or you should. Uh, so you obtain a chart. Uh, sorry, let me just uh, say one thing. We obtain a chart for. Uh, 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 in a neighborhood, yeah, for a neighborhood. A neighborhood of P in um, the pre-image in Y, basically. In Y intersected with you. Yeah. This, yeah, what's the question? Yeah. This phi bar there goes to R, no? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, I, what I meant to say is you keep everything and you switch the sign of XN. Sorry. That's what I meant to say. I apologize. I, I have to you restrict the the phi bar to to the image of minus infinity and a to a, right? What? You have to restrict. Yeah, the the phi bar is not defined in all of our n. I didn't say what the domain was, but uh, the the domain. I mean, let me write it here. Yeah, sorry, I was a little sloppy. Uh, but phi bar uh, is a map that goes from y intersection u to hn. OK? And because f of phi inverse it has this property, you can, you can check that uh, this uh, when you restrict to y, when you restrict to this set, then it's going to actually fit into hn. 
it's going to have this coordinate bigger than or equal to zero. I might have to change the sign here. Sorry, I, I was a little, yeah, a little sloppy, but it's something like that. No, I think it's exactly that. No, I think this is correct. Yeah, yeah because this guy will be uh, in y. Yeah, this this uh, term here will be in y if and only if x n is less than or equal to zero. So this is correct. Ah, okay. There you go. No. You got it. Yeah. So the point is that this. Uh, This is in y if and only if xn is less than or equal to 0. So if you switch the sign of xn, then uh, that's what you get with phi bar. Then you are in y if and only if uh, xn is bigger than 0, which means you know uh, this phi bar will We'll take this red part here, V bar. We'll take the red part to the green part. I understood. Um, yeah. Sorry, I think I think okay. So I, I think I'm actually being very sloppy. I, I, what I think, what I want, what I meant to say is that phi bar is phi composed with this thing. Yeah. So phi bar. So let me call this T, and the chart is. The chart phi bar is T composed with phi. Okay, now now I think it makes more sense. So if you take phi, which is the chart that make from the implicit function theorem that makes everything nice, and then you just switch the coordinate my xn, switch the sign. And now this picture here is t. And the phi is kind of implicit when you draw the picture. Oh, sorry for the confusion, but I let me know if you if you still don't understand, or if you do understand. I do. I do. What? I understood. No. Okay. Good. Good. Me too. Great. All right. Uh, so let's. Now let's try to, what we're going to do now is we're going to do some of the things that we did in the previous chapter of transversality for manifolds with boundary. See the, how, what the statements need to be for things to still hold. So the first one is, the first one is relatively simple, so I'll leave that as an exercise, but the following. So let x be a manifold with bound, let, let x and y be manifolds with boundary and y be a point in the interior. No. No, that's right. And a be a point in the interior of y such that A is, and let's fix, fix a function too. Sorry, when you do have stuff on the computer, it's always more. Let's mess here. So we pick two manifolds with boundary, we pick no. Let's first take a function. 
a smooth function from x to y. And let's pick a regular value of the function. So a, but it needs to be in the interior of y. A regular value of f. What we would like to show is that the preimage of a is still a, a manifold, but now with a boundary. But it's actually, we need more than this. Th this is not enough to set it to uh, imply that the preimage of A is a regular value. So we need one more condition, which is that A is a regular value of F and A is a regular value of the restriction of F to the boundary. So if you look at the bound, what I'm going to call the boundary of F, which is just the restriction of f to the boundary of x, that's going to be a function from f to, from boundary of x to y. Yeah. Actually, I need to, yeah, actually, I need to assume that the, the, the section doesn't hit the boundary of y. So let me just assume that y doesn't have boundary. And then this statement is vacuous. So take a point in y, which is a regular value of f, and which is also a regular value of the the preimage of A is a manifold with boundary given by simply the intersection of the preimage of A with the boundary of X. Okay, so this is kind of the most the nicest situation that you could imagine. So the, the preimage is not only a manifold with boundary, but the boundary is exactly the intersection of the manifold with the boundary of x. So the, there, you can't have a piece of the boundary in the middle, basically. That's one of the things this says. Or you can't have you know, the whole manifold contained in the boundary. So the proof of this is actually pretty straightforward. It's actually not that different from the, the proof of this previous proposition. So I'm going to leave this proof uh, as an exercise for you. I think it's uh, just a good practice of the same things, you know, inverse and implicit function theorem and the definition of manifolds. But instead of, of doing the proof, I want to talk about examples, or at least talk about two, one example and one non-example. So an example of this, well, let me start with a non-example because I think it's more interesting. The, the non-example is the following. Take a function that goes from H2 to R2 and that takes uh, X1, X2 to X2. Okay, so it's just the projection uh, no, sorry, R, not R2, R. Okay, so this is just the projection, uh, but restricted to H2. We just project. So what happens when you take the pre-image of zero? This actually happens to be a manifold, uh, but uh, this manifold is the boundary of H2. So it's a manifold without boundary, but it's completely contained in the boundary of H2. So it doesn't satisfy this condition at all. Like you can't, in, in, in other words, you have very little control over what the boundary is. In fact, this doesn't even have a boundary. Okay. I mean, it's possible for uh, the result of something in this proposition to not have boundary, 
but that would only happen if A is not in the image of the boundary of F. So, so if, if A is not in the image of the boundary F, then the pre-image of A could be some manifold that's containing the interior of X. There's no problem with that. Uh, but if it intersects the interior of X, then it has to have its boundary there. That's kind of what, that's what the proposition says. And can you see what fails from the hypothesis here? Can someone tell me where uh, this, what, what this function, where it fails to satisfy the hypothesis? You see, zero is a regular value of f. But it's not of partial f, right? Because in the boundary of x, exactly. Sure. Yes, that's exactly the point. Yes, yeah, so it, it, on on the boundary of of h two, zero is not a regular value. So you see that zero is a regular value of f, but not of partial f, because partial f is just identically equal to 0. OK, so 0 is not a regular value there. OK, great. So this is an interesting non-example. And you can think about more sophisticated ones. I think, you know, um, you can get very like kind of interesting examples. I'll I'll let you think about it. I mean, if you look at I don't know, x two minus if you look at x two minus f of x one, function sorry, function given like this. So I'll let you play around. You know, you can play around with this. Uh, and get a bunch of non-examples. Takes x one and x two, two x two minus I don't know g of x one where g is a function from r to r. For example, if g is a parabola, you could get something like this. So when you take the pre-image of 0, sorry, this, this would be the pre-image of 0 if g is a, is a certain parabola. And if you take just x1 squared, then you get a parabola like this. And it intersects this x-axis, but that's not the boundary. Uh, and you can play around and, you know, get a lot of interesting things. I think it, it, it's interesting to, yeah, if you can find something where the behave, where it's not even a manifold because of some funny thing that happens on the boundary. So I'll let you play with it. Uh, and you can, you know, maybe an, another exercise is to play around with uh, functions of this form and see if you can find uh, even more exotic things. Okay, but an example, you know, like to be to be nice, let's also talk about examples. I and mean, most things will actually be examples. Maybe the simplest example I can think of is if you just uh, look at the function that takes x1, x2, say to x1 squared plus x2 squared. I mean, here you get a bunch of examples too for most g's. But uh, let's this one is is nice. Uh, what happens is you get the intersection of the circle with h2. So the pre-image of not 1, the pre-image of 0 is just a point, and it's not going to satisfy the conditions for 0, but the pre-image of 1 is just the intersection of the circle with h2. OK. All right, so uh, I, I'm leaving this proposition as an exercise. Um, and again, it's not completely trivial, but the proof is very similar to the previous proposition. So, and yeah, being a regular value here will mean that we can, it's exactly what the, yeah, it, it's, um, yeah, it'll basically mean that you can straight, you can find a chart onto HN that will basically where x n will be the where, where the where um, well I won't say anymore I, I'll I'll leave the the proof as a proposition and uh, I I promise it's not much harder than the previous one okay, so now we have a theorem which is 
uh, I was going to actually rely on this preposition, but it's more interesting, which is the, the more general um, transversality theorem, uh, like taking pre images of transverse things. So let x and y be manifolds uh, with boundary. where the boundary of y, so we assume that the, we always assume the target doesn't have boundary. Um, and let f be a smooth function, oh, and we also fix the submanifold, manifold with boundary, and this eraser is very small. We pick a submanifold of y, and we assume that the boundary of y and the boundary of w are empty. Um, now we let f be a smooth function from x to y, such that f is transverse to w, and the boundary of f is transverse to w. Oh, I should make one comment that I forgot to, to mention here, uh, which is that the, the being a regular value of a function whose domain uh, has boundary and being transverse uh, to a submanifold, also in the case where the domain has boundary, this is a condi I mean, I didn't write that down for manifold with boundary, but it's exactly the same definition. There is no modification because the tangent space is well defined, as I said before. So we can talk about transversality exactly the same way. Okay. Um, yeah. So and you can talk about transversality at a point of the boundary, and you can also talk about the transversality of the boundary map. But notice the boundary map now is actually a, a, a genuine map of manifolds without boundary. So here, to talk about this part, for example, there is no need for a new definition. And to talk about this part, you have to say what happens on the boundary, okay? Uh, but the, the, anyway, the, the, the consequence is that the pre-image of W is a manifold with boundary given by the intersection of the manifold with the boundary of x. And so it's the same thing that happens for regular values, but it's a, a little bit more general. OK, so um, how do we prove that? Now, first of all, note that If the boundary of f is transverse, so if you take a point on the boundary of x, so if x is on the boundary of x, is a regular point, no, not a regular, uh, such that the boundary of f is transverse to w at x, then f is also transverse to w at x. So being transverse to w at a point on the boundary for the boundary of the function is, it implies that it's transverse for the whole function. And that's because uh, if you take the derivative of the boundary, uh, that's just the, the, at a point x, this is just the restriction of df, restricted to the tangent space of the boundary of x. Okay, so therefore the image of this guy, so this goes from this. This is, this is contained in dfx, in the image of the whole tangent space. So, you know, I can draw a picture sort of the tangent space. If you're on, on the boundary of a manifold, the tangent space is a subset of the whole tangent space the, ten the tangent space of the boundary at this point is a subset of the whole tangent space at this point. And the linearization of the restriction, the, the restricted function is just the 
linearization of the function restricted is to the subspace. So the equation of the of transversality of for the boundary of F implies the, the transversality for F. Okay. So basically we have to wait. É um, é um, sub, é um subconjunto, mas também um subespaço vetorial, não? Do espaço dele. Sim, sim, é um subespaço. Ah, tá, tudo. Vector subspace, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it's the same thing. I mean, the, the, actually, this is just df. When you restrict the function, you take the derivative, uh, you get the same derivative in that direction, in those directions. Um, okay, so, yeah, so first of all, um, yeah, bec because F is transverse to W, F, uh, the interior of F will also be transverse to W, so that just means that, uh, the, basically what I'm trying to say is that this condition here is equi equivalent to saying the interior of F is transverse to W, and the boundary of F is transverse to W. Okay, so uh, if you look at the first condition, the, well, you just have, uh, from, based on the transversality theorem from, from before, this just means that uh, the pre-image of Y if you look at the, what's in the, on the pre-image of W in the interior of X, this is a manifold without boundary. You just restrict after the interior, and then you can just apply the, the, the usual transversality theorem. So you just have to show something on the boundary. OK, so now let uh, x be a point in the pre-image of w intersected with the boundary. That's kind of that's where it's interesting. And then as before, as we've done before, we can assume, or not assume, we can construct uh, a submersion pi from a neighborhood of f of x to r n minus k, uh, where k is the dimension of W, and V is a neighborhood of f of x. So again, this is this is standard using the implicit function theorem. So if you have a submanifold of y, and you to have f of x, uh, then you can find a submersion, uh, which is basically like you you, you first look at the, the chart that straightened this makes this an RK and then some orthogonal or some transverse direction RN minus K and you project to RN minus K. That's your submersion. And the point is that the pre-image of zero is exactly your W intersection with this uh, open set. Okay, so in a neighborhood of F of X, you can write W as the pre-image of zero by a submersion. Okay, this is, I don't know, one of these equivalent things to the, the inverse function here. I've already talked about this. And then again, as in the case, in the boundary less case, uh, we can prove that F is transverse to W at X, if and only if X is a regular point of pi, sorry, yeah, that's right, pi composed with f. And again, and, and by the same reason, the boundary is transverse to w at x, if and only if x is a regular point of pi composed with f. And now we can use the proposition that I left as an exercise to say that in that uh, in the neighborhood of this regular point, at least, uh, 
the pre-image of W uh, is going to be a neighborhood, uh, a manifold with boundary, and the boundary is exactly given by uh, the intersection with the boundary of X. In fact, this part here, um, we don't really need because I told you that this implies this. Okay, so it all kind of depends on this proposition that I left an extra sense. Okay. Any questions? No. Okay, so now we can talk about Sard's theorem. And the version of Sard's theorem that we one is the following. So we pick a manifold. Uh, we'll pick two manifolds with boundary. Well, we, we always pick M to be a manifold with boundary. And Y to be a manifold without boundary. Um, then the set of points y and y such that y is a critical value of f or a critical value of the boundary of f as measure zero. Okay, that will imply uh, that there will be a plant there will be plenty there will be a dense subset of y of uh of regular values uh, for example we can take the preimage so that's kind of the as you remember the, the main technical or the, the the main hard theorem in the proof of tom transversality theorem the rest is just the language of jets um okay so well what how what's the proof the proof is it's pretty simple well, the, the set of critical points of F union the set of critical points of the boundary of F by the comment that I made here, um, by this comment here, if you are a critical point of the boundary of F, then you're also a critical point, sorry, if you're a critical point of F, then you're a critical point of the boundary of F. Um, so you actually only need to look at the critical points of the interior of F and the critical points of the boundary of F. Okay, so this is kind of the, the converse of what I said before, that if you're a regular value for the boundary of F, then you're a regular value for F. No, sorry, it's true for, for, for regular points, not for regular values. If, you, if you're a regular point of uh, the boundary of F, that means you're on the boundary of X, and you also have to be a regular point for F. Because you know of this, this equality here. So, like, if this is the whole space on the right, then the on the left, then the right has to be the whole space too. Okay. Uh, so you know, kind of the the contrapositive of this statement is what I just wrote here. It's yeah. So if you're a critical val a critical value, a critical point, that means the derivative is not surjective. Um, so if the, yeah, if you're critical value here, then you are critical value here. As long as you're on the boundary. So you still have to look at the critical points in the interior. Okay. Oi, professor. Sim. É, então quem são densos vão ser os, os valores regulares dos dois, nesse caso. De uh, F e do bordo. Ou... Exatamente, é. Ele tem que ser, tem que ser um valor regular. Quer dizer, tanto de um quanto de outro vai, vai ser denso, mas o ponto que a interseção vai ser densa também. Ah, tá. Certo, certo, certo. Professor, desculpa se eu estiver falando bobagem, mas você não quer dizer os pontos... É, na última igualdade, você não quer dizer os pontos críticos de F que estão na borda? Que não é a mesma coisa que os pontos críticos do del F, né? Porque, sei lá, pode ser que em del F... Uh, não seja subjetor, mas se adiciona a última, a última dimensão e aí vire subjetor, né? Alguma coisa assim. Não, 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 mas eu tô, eu tô colocando a união dos pontos críticos de DLF desde o início. Uh, 
Mas a gente não viu aqui os pontos críticos de... Você acabou de falar que se um ponto é um ponto crítico para F, então também é um ponto crítico para DLF, certo? Uh, certo. Então... Ah, tá. De de deixa eu... Sim, mas ele pode ser um ponto crítico de, DO, de DOF sem ser um ponto crítico de F. Porque eu tô, estou tô querendo olhar para os valores críticos de F e de DOF. Né? Eu, quero, eu, quero, eu, 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 eu quero olhar o conjunto dos valores críticos de F é, ou de DOF. Né? Então, eu tenho que pegar a união... É, de, de, dos, dos, dos pontos críticos dos dois e pegar as imagens do, do, dos dois, né? Então, eu começo com a união desses dois. E o que eu estou falando é que se eu tiver sobre a fronteira de X, então, eu vou, se eu tiver aqui, eu vou estar aqui também. Então, posso jogar fora a parte da fronteira daqui. Uhum, verdade. Então, obrigado. Bele, beleza? Desculpa, a história é seu. Sim, obrigado. Quem é que está falando mesmo, que eu não estou vendo o nome? É o Pietro. Pietro, ah, obrigado. Ainda não reconheço, eu nem reconheço a face de vocês, quanto menos a voz. É, infelizmente. É, de repente, até o final do verão, a gente já reconhece todo mundo. Ok. So, we have this inequality. And then now, uh, we can apply the start's theorem for both the interior of F and the boundary of F. So, both the interior of F and the boundary of F are functions between manifolds without boundary. So, uh, Well, first I have to apply F to this. So when I apply F to this, I have the F of that union boundary of F of the critical point. That's the same as just applying F because F is the same as the boundary of F where it's defined. So this is equal to the image. So the set of critical values Union, oops. The image of the critical points is the critical values, and then the image of the critical points is the critical values. Okay, and then now I can apply the classical version of Sartre's theorem. So this one has measure zero, and this one has measure zero. So both of these have measure zero. And the union of two sets of measure zero still has measure zero. So this is measure zero. Okay. And this is pretty, pretty simple. Okay. Any questions about what I just did? Okay, so given Sartre's theorem, then you can actually go back to transversality and redo everything that we did uh, for the Tom transversality theorem. Uh, so we also have um, transversality theorem, which says, you know, if you have two manifolds, X and Y, manifolds such that the boundary of Y is empty uh, and you pick a submanifold of the kth jet space we have to assume that the submanifold uh, the part on y is empty so when i project that to y i don't i don't get boundary i think that's something I have to assume. Um, then the set of smooth functions such that the kth jet of F is transverse to W and the kth jet of the boundary is transverse to W is residual. 
And so the, you know, this is just taking the previous theorem and, and adapting to the context where x has boundary. And this is probably an overkill for most applications. Uh, but I just wanted to write it down, and you can prove this if you'd like. If you want an exercise, this I think would be a nice one. Just go through the proof of the tom heli theorem and see what little tweaks you have to make to allow for x to have boundary. Deixa eu ver se eu não, não entendi ali na segunda linha. É, o bordo de beta, não, não entendi. Sim, yeah, so, quando você aplica beta, é, quando você, beta é a projeção de W sobre Y. Ah, tudo bem. Tá. Ah. Tá, ok. Ok. So, yeah, it's a, it's a submanifold and you have to... Yeah, maybe you have to say, you know, a little more. Maybe part of the exercise maybe is to, is to state the theorem correctly. Um, I, I don't know if it's, you have to think about it. Like, if it's obvious that the image of W is necessarily a submanifold of Y. So this condition, part of the exercise is to figure out if that's the right condition. But as you see, you know, the, the corollary of this is very straightforward and it's, um, maybe that's what we really want. So the corollary of this is uh, sort of the more standard transversality theorem is that if you have two manifolds and Y doesn't have boundary and W is a submanifold uh, such that the boundary of W doesn't have boundary. Okay, so this is kind of the stereotypical. Um, th th this situation will give rise to uh, some other W as a su uh, submanifold of, of the jet space. Um, you, know, you just take like X times W or something in the zeroth jet space. Um, but anyway, th this is the situation that that we we have, and the point that we usually have, and the, what we want to say is that the the set of functions. Well, the corollary is that the set of functions, the functions uh, which are transverse to W and transverse to the boundary of W is residual. OK? Um, so I guess this is. This is maybe the main thing. So if you if you're tired of jets, uh, you can just prove this this one using Sard's theorem directly. Um, but I think the proof is not much harder for jets. You just have to figure out the exact condition on W, because you really cannot have W with boundary. That would not, you know, you you would not be able to get a manifold if if you allowed um, W to have boundary. I think on the last line is uh, f transverse to w and uh, partial f transverse to w, not... Um... Yeah, sorry, my, my mind uh, did a permutation. Okay, yeah, okay. And what happens yeah. to the space of jets um, when x has uh, boundary? Um, is now a manifold with boundary? I don't yeah, think so. Yeah, so th th that's the thing. Uh, it, if th That's where you have to be careful, because it only is a manifold with boundary if x has boundary and y does not have boundary. So if, if x has boundary and y doesn't have boundary, then the space of jets is a manifold with boundary. Because the space of jets, remember, it's modeled after, you know, you take a chart in u, a chart in, uh, in y, and some space of polynomials, which is where the derivatives live. So this part here will be uh, in some Euclidean space, R something. This part here will be in R something. And this is the only part that will be in H n, say. So if you take H n and you multiply by a bunch of R Euclidean spaces, you still get an H something. OK, yes. The, the problem would be, I mean, just think about the simplest situation, which is the zeroth jet. The zeroth jet is just the product of the two spaces. If one of them has boundary and the other doesn't have boundary, this is still a manifold with boundary. Right? Yes. 
But if both of them have boundary, then this, the product is no longer a manifold with boundary. And this is, a, this is kind of a subtle comment, but it's something I, would talk, I was going to talk about uh, a little bit later. Yeah, but l let me just say that now, like if you have you know, the product of two manifolds, you know is a manifold, but if one of them has boundary, then what happens you know, is the ch a chart, you take a point P, Q, say, over here in the product, and you want to find a chart uh, here, then if P has a chart uh, in HN and Q has a chart in HN2, also both on the boundary, and then their product uh, now does not, you don't, you can't find a chart on the product uh, in HN. You actually have a, uh, you can find a chart in the product in something like this. So, I mean, so this is, if this is H2 and this is H2, I mean, I'm just drawing a concrete picture. Then you can find a pic, you can find something that will live in, I mean, I'm just going to draw a picture like this, R4. In like, some some region of our four that has a corner. Seria algo tipo uma variedade com quinas. Exatamente, exatamente. Isso é uma variedade com quinas. Ah, tá. o, 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 o mais fácil de entender, né, é você pegar dois intervalos, né? Um intervalo e um intervalo. Uh, so here you have your interval is a manifold with boundary, and the boundary are these points, and you take another manifold with boundary. Then what's the neighborhood of, say, this point, this point? You're going to have exactly something like this. When you take the product of the two, chart, the two charts, you're going to get a chart. It's actually a square chart, but it doesn't matter. You get a chart like this. OK, okay I, I should say one more thing, which is that smoothly, you get what's called a manifold with corners that I, I haven't talked about. But you know, it's, it's not very hard to imagine what it's like. You know, The charts are modeled on these uh, spaces like that on the on these corners of Rn. Uh, but topologically, it's still a manifold with boundary. Because if you take something like this, this chart, you know, it, it's kind of bad, but it's still a homeomorphism. It's still homeomorphic to this. So yeah, homeomorphically, it's still a, it's, it's still a topological manifold with boundary. But uh, it's no longer a smooth manifold with boundary. OK? All right. Um, yeah, I mean, this condition here, like I said, I didn't, I didn't uh, think about it very much. It might be a different condition. It might be something like, that, the, that W is a manifold with boundary, and the and the boundary is contained over the fiber of the boundary of X. So maybe maybe the condition is not this. Maybe the condition, maybe it's not this. Maybe the condition is that the boundary of W is contained in alpha inverse of the boundary of X. Maybe this is the right condition. So yeah, I didn't. I didn't think about this very hard, but I think this may be the right condition. Well, part of the exercise is to check whether this is exactly the right condition. But if you have a concrete application, all the applications that we have before, I'm sure that it's even easier to figure out what is the appropriate W. But anyway, the second uh, part of the corollary, which I think is uh, kind of it's it's interesting and very applicable is the following like if you take a smooth function such that uh, it's transverse to the, its boundary is transverse to w then for every neighborhood v of f uh, there exists G in V such that G is transverse to W. Well, this you can always, you know, this, this just follows from the density of the space of transverse functions. Uh, but we can actually also assume that the boundary of F is, the, is equal to the boundary of G, uh, or actually even more, that F equals to G near the boundary, and F equals G 
in the neighborhood of the boundary of x. So you know, if you start with some function and you know it's transverse to w along the boundary, then you can perturb it, but actually you don't have to change it in the neighborhood of the boundary, and then you perturb it somewhere outside of that to obtain the full transversality. Okay, this is basically very similar to the statement that we had before uh, with no boundary, where if you, if you had an open set where you knew that the transversality condition held, then you could perturb the function outside uh, of this uh, open set, in a, you know, in, in a closed set outside of this open set. And you could keep it in equal in this open set. Okay, so, it, but it's it's interesting, I guess, uh, if we if you choose this to be a neighborhood of the boundary, and you know maybe an exercise to see why th this holds. I'll, I'll just tell you with words, and you can write this down. You know, if if the boundary of F is transverse to W, then F is going to be transverse to W along the boundary of X, but also in a neighborhood of the boundary of X because uh, the transversality is, is an open condition. Okay, so um, as you can see, you know, I, I give the class and there are a bunch of little exercises here and there and I think you can try to fill them up. I think that uh, will be good. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's the end. That's all I wanted to say about manifolds with boundary. Um, well, before we end, let me just state a theorem which we won't prove for a while. But the theorem is the classification of one manifold. It has the following. Every um, smooth uh, compact well, I'm not going to write smooth because all of my manifolds are smooth. For every compact and connected one manifold with boundary is it's either uh, S1, or it's diffeomorphic. It's either diffeomorphic to S1, or it's diffeomorphic to either S1 or the interval, any closed interval, the interval zero one. So an op uh, one dimensional manifold that's compact and, cl and closed, and c compact and connected, it's either just a circle or it's an interval like this. Maybe you know, this, if you, if you uh, assume it's, it's compact and you assume it's a smooth manifold, then it's, it's easier. But it's also true for uh, topological one manifolds. Uh, and if you drop the compactness as assumption, dropping compactness, then you can only have, can only have open intervals and sort of an interval like this, open and closed. Okay. I guess, you know, you can state the theorem like that. If you, if you, every connected one manifold is with boundaries, diffeomorphic to either S1 and then the intervals from zero to one where you play with all the different, you know, closed, closed, open, open, and open and closed. Okay. If you drop the connectedness assumption, then, you know, we can have a disjoint union of these guys, um, uh, countable disjoint union of these guys, so it just, doesn't add very much. 
Okay, and, and the reason I, you know, kind of put the compactness assumption here in the theorem is that that's what we're going to use a lot. So this classification of one manifold is what we use, we're going to use all the time in intersection theory. But we're only going to prove this a little bit later using Morse theory. But if you are interested, there are proofs of this theorem that don't use Morse theory. So if you want to, you know, play with something a little bit harder, you can try to prove the classification of one manifolds. I know one way you can do it is using, um, like, curvature. Um, so maybe you can, you know, take a one manifold, embed it into R3. You know, it, it's always embedded into R3. So a one manifold will be uh, connected. One manifold will be the, the image of a curve. And you can play around, I don't know, with curvature and parametrization by, I don't know, unit length or something, and then show that it's diffeomorphic to um, one of these things. So that may be a good exercise, too. And yeah, well, since we don't have that much time, um, I'm going gonna, I'm I'm gonna to stop here, and then we'll start talking about orientations next time.